Good afternoon. My name is Alex Reich, and I'm pleased to welcome you to the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, and to the fifth event of our monthly webinar series, Climate Conversations, Pathways to Action. The National Academies provide independent objective advice to inform policy with evidence, spark progress and innovation, and confront challenging issues for the benefit of society. In keeping with this mission, we're excited to host these conversations about issues relevant to national policy action on climate change. Our conversation today will be recorded and made available on this same web page tomorrow. You, we won't be taking questions from the audience, but we would appreciate your feedback and your ideas for future conversations, which I invite you to share after the event in the survey linked just above this video. Above the video, you'll also find a link to register for our July 15th climate conversation on climate security, featuring Aaron Sikorsky, Deputy Director of the Center for Climate and Security, and Swathi Virabali, Foreign Affairs Specialist at United States Africa Command. They'll discuss how different parts of the security community are thinking about climate risks, what implications those risks hold for policy and planning, and where there are capacity gaps or aspects of climate security that need more research. Today, we'll also talk about the risks from climate change, but focused specifically on the risks it poses to US infrastructure, including the impacts from extreme heat and drought, as those of you joining from the West can viscerally understand. We'll also delve into the engineering solutions that can play a role in building a resilient and net zero future, as well as into how to prepare the next generation of engineers for such a monumental task. We're honored to be joined by Mariette DiCristina, Dean of the College of Communication at Boston University and former Editor-in-Chief of Scientific American, who also moderated our first climate conversation on decarbonization. Mariette will introduce our conversationalists and moderate the event. Thank you again for joining the National Academies for Climate Conversations. Mariette, it's all yours. Thanks so much, Alex. It's great to be here with all of you. But most of us probably don't think all that much about infrastructure, but it really supports the functioning of all of our towns and cities and, and indeed countries in many ways. Think about all the roads you drive on, the, the bridges you go over, the tunnels, the electric grid, the water, railways, and more. And the topic of today's climate conversation, as Alex has pointed out, feels especially timely to me today, given the national debate about the future of our infrastructure. Because we see infrastructure is built to last for decades, sometimes even a hundred years or more. So what we decide to do today will have a large effect on how things go tomorrow, including how we adapt to or mitigate climate change in the future. We're going to learn a lot more about the important role of infrastructure from our two experts today. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce both of them to you. First, let's say hello to John L. Anderson, who is president of the National Academy of Engineering. He was most recently distinguished professor of chemical engineering and president of the Illinois Institute of Technology. Before that, he was provost and executive, um, excuse me, before that he was provost and executive vice president at Case Western Reserve University, following 28 years at Carnegie Mellon University, eight as Dean of Engineering, and five years at Cornell University. Hello there to you, John. It's so lovely to have you here today. Thank you. And now let's say hello to Thomas P. Boswick, a senior executive with more than 30 years of experience in both the public and private sectors. He served as the 53rd Chief of Engineers and Commanding General of the US Army Corps of Engineers, where he was responsible for most of the nation's civil works infrastructure and military construction. An expert in crisis response, he controlled the nuclear codes during the tragic events of 9-11, and he led the nation's recovery effort following Hurricane Sandy. Hello there to you, Tom. Nice to have you this afternoon. Thank you, Mary. It's great to be with you and John and the rest of the team. So let's just dive in, both of you. Um, let's start with the basics. Tell us a little bit more about your backgrounds and what brought you to this space you know, of thinking about climate and infrastructure. John, maybe we can start with you. Thank you, Mary. First, I wanna say I appreciate the opportunity to be here and uh, thank the organizers for allowing Tom and I to interact with you on the important topic. Uh, as a chemical engineer, I was generally more concerned with the small, that is, small things and not so much climate and larger things like that. But I think about 15 years ago, I became convinced that climate change is gonna be something serious. Uh, the scientific data 
<laughs> it started to become overwhelming as much as we didn't want to believe it. So then I realized that uh, this is this is for real. I'm going to think about it. I think one thing that uh, makes me drives me to try to do something about it is I believe in equity and quality of life for all our citizens, and other privileged groups will suffer most from the impacts of climate change, and perhaps even from some of the methods to address climate change. So we have to, uh, as engineers, be cognizant of of that. Uh, of that problem. Thirdly, uh, I have, uh, I don't think this is going to impact my children, but I have five grandchildren and climate change will definitely impact their lives. And I don't want to leave them a, a world where we dumped all the problems that we've created onto their doorstep. So uh, that played a role in my interest as well. Thank you, John. Over to you, Tom. Well, I'd like to thank the organizers uh, for this um, event as well. I, I think it's a very important topic and I feel honored to be here with John and you, Marriott, to, to discuss it. And when I left high school, I thought I was gonna be a, a carpenter. And uh, my dad uh, was an enlisted soldier and my mom and dad had high school educations and we had five children. So I, I didn't see a way to go to college. and. And I worked three jobs in order for my brother to go and my oldest brother. And I didn't want to put that on my siblings. And fortunately, I was accepted to West Point. And I and everybody there at the time was an engineer. I mean, you only had four electives. So whether you liked it or not, you're studying civil, mechanical, electrical, and, and, and you studied the liberal arts as well. But I, I gravitated towards engineering and then later taught mechanical and civil courses at West Point, and then later in life earned a systems degree. So I, I've done these different types of engineering, but in, in the end, I, I think it's really about systems and not individual projects. And, and climate is, is a big part of that system that infrastructure is a part of. And, and I've seen it up close and personal when, when climate change as an impact on society and whether it's after Hurricane Katrina or uh, the work that we did after Sandy and seeing that um, the, the types of projects and infrastructure projects we had to build, you can only build them so big and so strong. And if you go down to New Orleans, for example, you'll see some of the best projects in the world. I mean, there's nothing like uh, the water pumping station down there that could empty an Olympic swimming pool in three seconds. There's nothing like it in the world. Or the Inner Harbor barrier. Um, uh, these types of projects are one of a kind and, and thanks to our great engineers and, and, and other teammates, both public and private sector, they've been able to respond to the needs. But again, you can only build them so big and so strong in the next bigger, um, hurricane is on the way. And, and what that's taught me is that we really need to build resilient uh, systems. And we can talk about that a, a bit more, but uh, those are a couple of points that I'll focus on during our discussion today. Thanks so much, Tom. Let, let's stick with you just for a minute there um, and, and continue with the basics. Let's talk about people, people use the word infrastructure to mean a lot of things. It turns out there are a lot of definitions out there. How, how do both of you see infrastructure? Well, uh, when I'm, would you like me to start, Marianne? Yes, please. Yeah, one of my colleagues in the Corps, uh, Major General Mike Walsh, um, he was the head of our civil works, and he often spoke about the four R's. And one of those R's was always forgotten, but he, he talked about the roads, the runways, the rail, and the fourth R is rivers. Um, uh, and, and we live in a maritime nation. And to give you an idea, there are 12,000 miles of navigable waterways within the United States. About 9,000 of that is inside the Mississippi River and tributary system, but 12,000 miles of navigable waterways in the United States. To put that in perspective, that is more navigable waterways than the rest of the world combined. So we're a maritime nation, whether we realize it or not, we have an, a West Coast and East Coast. We've got the Gulf Coast, we've got, got 
uh, the, the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, we've got the Great Lakes uh, with $4 billion in revenue a year. We are a maritime nation and you tie those ports to the inland waterways and about $1.7 trillion um, it moves along, of, of our economy moves along that water system that the core manages. So, so this is real part of our economy and, and to not focus on the, the river infrastructure uh, would be very uh, a very big uh, challenge for the United States. And, and we've, we've done that. We, we haven't managed the infrastructure of the rivers. Beyond that, uh, the traditional built environment is certainly part of the infrastructure. Everything that's constructed uh, in the built environment mm -hmm. is important, but I think um, equally important are those nature-based um, environmental uh, type of infrastructure, whether it's uh, living shorelines, for example, uh, that's part of our infrastructure. And it's an important part that, of our ecosystem that we have to focus on as we, as we look at climate change. I think beyond that traditional infrastructure, we ought to think about things like broadband and, and the, the requirements to build that broadband in order for the infrastructure uh, of the country to be sustainable. But those are some of the highlights of what I think about when I think about infrastructure. Thank you, Tom. So um, Tom's, Tom's definitions are really helpful, John. I wonder if in addressing this question, you might just give us a few highlights about how climate change affects these different areas of infrastructure. For instance, if you have an extreme drought or heat wave. Well, I, yeah, I just wanted to add too that the word resilience because uh, 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 infrastructure, we should be looking at the resilience defined as the ability to withstand and recover from disruptions and adapt to changes. But I, I, I like what Tom said at, at the uh, end there with the digital and physical, I look at uh, the two together. And I think the problems in Texas indicated how the physical and the digital relate to each other. And uh, both, both have to be integrated and robust in the connectivity. Uh, and finally, um, I think now human beings are kind of being integrated into infrastructure through artificial intelligence. And I'm wondering if that's gonna be a third leg of infrastructure in some way. Uh, that will help us, hopefully help us, if done properly, uh, maintain our, our uh, infrastructure. There are a lot of examples, as you pointed out, of um, uh, things that can happen. Permafrost is one uh, where um, uh, in the built environment is, that uh, Tom alluded to is on uh, frozen ground, which is supposed to be frozen 12 months a year and now isn't. So there have been articles about uh, about what to do about that and, and being more diligent about preparing for changes. Um, there's uh, water management areas, of course, uh, and people in the Southwest are very much aware of that, but even on the East Coast with uh, flooding, too much water and uh, wind, of course, and salinization of soils near coastal regions. Uh, so uh, there are a lot of things to worry about and uh, with this, and I think it differs from region to region. So there's no one answer for the United States. It has to be geographically targeted and many different disciplines have to come into play. I think the important point is we have to worry about it and we have to do something about it and, and design for it. Thank you, John. I'd like to come back to, to Tom maybe and, and to you as well. So thinking about infrastructure, what is, you know, what is the overall condition of the U.S. infrastructure and, and what do you think are the key challenges in responding to climate change? You've mentioned a couple of them, permafrost and, and some others, but maybe there are some others you'd like to mention. Well, I, I love the report card. I used it in almost all my congressional hearings mm -hmm. and I testified 33 times that none of them were voluntary. This is but, the report um, card that gave us a C, a, was it a C minus from the American Society of Civil Engineers? Is that the one? Yes, yes, that, that, that's it. Um, but it, it, I, I love the, the report card. It, it, I, I think it gives us a base from which we can all operate from. 
and understand. I think before you can fix a problem, you have to understand that you have one. And, and that gives us all a common understanding of where the challenges are. Um, in general, you know, much of the core's infrastructure, I, I would say, is more than 50 years old. Uh, and it's lacked the operations and maintenance budgets um, that it needs in order to be uh, maintained. Um, so, so that's a, a big part of the challenge. It's old infrastructure and it's infrastructure that hasn't been maintained and some of it is grumbling. Uh, that's one problem. I, I think the, the other major factor is how do you pay for it? Uh, I remember during one of my testimonies, um, one of the members of Congress asked, General Bostic, um, you guys are really slow. Um, the Corps takes too long to finish these projects. Um, how much money do you need to finish the projects you're currently working on? And I said, 23 billion. And he said, how much money did we give you this year? And I said, one and a half billion. And he said, so you're right. That's about 15 years. Uh, we are slow. And some are going to go faster. Some are going to go slower. But the problem is we've got on any given day over 3,000 projects. We receive money. We spread it out like peanut butter over these projects. And we take a long time to finish. Um, I came back from that meeting and, and I was talking to our leaders and, and, and a big part of it is we, we weren't going to receive that money. We shouldn't expect to receive that money given everything that the, that the Congress has to commit resources to. And a big part of how we pay for it in the future, I think, has to consider public-private partnerships. So we worked hard on that in the Corps of Engineers. Um, the other thing I would say is that whenever something bad happens, uh, a lot of folks say we're reactive, we're not proactive. And to a sense, to a degree, that's true. But, but the real issue here is we cannot set priorities. Um, and when we set priorities, we do really well. But the challenge is setting those priorities in a government where um, you know, I grew up in California and Senator Feinstein, it's hard for her to vote for something in Louisiana unless it's a crisis. And crises are things like war. And I'm not picking on Senator Feinstein. She's a great, uh, great um, uh, congresswoman who's done wonderful things for our country. And I'm just using her as an example, California as, as an example. It's hard to, to, to put money in projects in New Orleans, for example, if there's not a crisis. Um, so in, in, on the, on, if you look at war, that, that's the ultimate kind of crisis. And everybody comes together and says, we're going to fund that as a priority. I've seen this happen once on the inland waterways where the, um, it was Senator Feinstein and Senator Lamar Alexander working together to say, hey, uh, instead of uh, piecemealing these projects and taking forever to get all of these done, let's prioritize the first one. And let's focus on that. And that was Olmstead Lock and Dam. And, and we'll get that one done and then we'll move to the next one. Kentucky Lock, Chick Lock. And that's that's worked very well. So I think setting priorities is the other really important part of, of moving forward, regardless of climate change. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to ask um, John one other question before we kind of talk more about the engineering solutions that we might uh, be, be applying. John, March last year, you wrote an article called Climate Change, a Call to Arms for the NAE, the National Academy of Engineering. Can you explain why you see it that way and what exactly you meant by that? Well, I was uh, surprised uh, when I um, went around the country right before COVID, I was visiting various regions and talking with NAE members. And I asked them what's on their mind. And I thought I'd get a lot of other things, not enough budget for research and so on. And everyone, every group listed the number one concern is climate change. I think if I had done this four or five years earlier, I wouldn't have heard that. I mm. think that's a very good sign. And these are members from both the academe and industry. And they, they wanted to talk all about this and, uh, uh, and what we should be doing. And they had ideas and so on. So I think that that was, uh, uh, I, I think that that's why the call for action came from that 
those particular visits. I think another interesting thing now is we're finding that private industry is now on board and, and realizing that there is a problem for all of us. We're all on the same boat called the planet Earth and uh, we got to do something about it. Um, finally, I think engineering is engineers are uh, uh, well suited for, um, uh, for this because of our view of systems. We tend to look at things as systems and interacting parts and um, climate, climate, the impact of climate change is certainly a systems problem. And, and actually the uh, uh, cause of climate change is a system problem. So I think that engineering has a lot to offer and there are a lot of opportunities for innovation and engineers like to innovate. So I think that that's, that's another another piece uh, of this. I, I wonder if I could make a comment too about what Tom was talking about in terms of crumbling infrastructure. If you go to Asia and you go to airports, you're amazed at how nice the airports are in Asia. Uh, in, in, in China, I think it's four or five different airports and Korea and whatever. And I just, it was uh, Japan. I just, I, I, you know, it was amazing. And then I come home and I go to some of our airports and it's just really kind of sad to see what's happening. Now they're newer and they're able to do things, but there's always this, this tension between maintenance and innovation. You, you need both. And if you've ever been a you know university president trying to raise money, it's very difficult to raise money for sustaining what you have. It's easier to raise money for doing something new. But somehow, as Tom was alluding to, you have to get the money, the funds, to, to keep up what you have in addition to uh, modernizing and introducing innovative ideas into uh, in, in infrastructure into the system. So I think that's really, really an important point. And, uh, and it reminds me of Churchill's famous expression that Americans always do the right thing after they've exhausted all their possibilities. And I think with infrastructure, that's really true. So uh, let, let, I'd like to, you now bridge over to talk about some of those those innovative solutions. But, but before that, just a, a quick recap for folks who might have joined a bit late. We've heard about infrastructure in terms of it being parts of roads, runways, rail, and rivers. So water infrastructure, very important, as well as the traditional built environment and nature-based, our living shorelines and how they help us uh, deal with climate change as, as things shift and how important resilience is to all of these systems. And you know, as as things begin to happen in the climate, how that's changing our need to to adapt to that. There was the example of of permafrost, which is supposed to remain permanently frozen, melting, and the impacts that it has when you've you've built things into it. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about the nation's report card. So we're we're not uh, maybe excelling. We got a, a rate of uh, of a C minus on on our current uh, infrastructure, and that it's it's. It's hard to get the sufficient budgets necessarily to, to maintain over time and um, how setting priorities is gonna be deeply important and how climate itself is a rising priority. John was just giving the example about surveying uh, uh, you know, NAE engineers and that it, not climate was their number one priority. And now that private industry is on board and engineers are you know, ready to, to apply their systems thinking to forward change, we're, we're at a, a, in a, an excellent opportunity to look at what building solutions could be. So let's let's move to that topic. The next section of our discussion, gentlemen. Um, you know, how does the in either, either one of you who might like to start? How, how does the engineering community think about climate resilient infrastructure, and how's that thinking changed over the years, mm -hmm. um, given that we're seeing more you know weather disasters and so on. Yeah, I'd be happy to start. Or, go, go ahead, Tom. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Tom. Yeah, with um, increasing sea level rise and, and storms with greater intensity and greater frequency, um, I think we have to think much more about resilience in in, in concert with risk. And um, I've got a small chart here, and I'll put it up and see if you can see it. Um, but can you see that, Marriott? Yeah, just a tiny bit higher so we can see time on the bottom. There we are. So it's time, but what it says is that that if you think about functionality on the y-axis and time on the x-axis, you mm -hmm. plan it to be uh, 
resilient and 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 then at a certain point in time you're going to have a disruption and that disruption is going to push you down and and what risk does risk tries to fight against that disruption it tries to build a structure that doesn't bend and what we're saying with resilience you want to bend but don't break and then you want to recover and that last part is really important you want to adapt you want to ad adapt so that you're stronger so that your next cycle, you're actually, you have a higher level of functionality. So with that as an example, I, I think the, the best example I think of is the Mississippi River and tributary system. And a, a, a little story here, I, I went to China and I met with Minister Chen Li, the Minister of Water Resources uh, for the country. And he said to me, you know, General Bostic, the flood of 1927 was a a really big flood. The flood of 1994 was a, a bad flood. And the flood of 2011 was a bad flood. He said, which one was the biggest? Which one was the worst for America? And I chuckled and I said, you know, Mr. Chen Li, you know, most Americans wouldn't know those floods. But, um, but the biggest in terms of water flow down the Mississippi was 2011. But most people don't know that because few people died. And what happened was that in, in the flood of 1927, we had near a thousand people die. We had 800,000 refugees. We had millions of acres of land that was flooded. And the Corps was told to build the Mississippi rivers and tributary system. And this was a systems of locks and dams and floodways. And when we got to the choke point just south of, of St. Louis, there's a point there where uh, the Ohio, the Mississippi come together and it causes a huge amount of water, uh, more water than you can build anything that can resist it. So, so we had to absorb it somehow. And what the great engineers that started building this in 1928 said was we need a floodway that we can open up the floodway five miles wide and 65 miles long and allow that to flood on purpose. So if anyone remembers the 2011 flood, they remember, again, my colleague, uh, Major General uh, Mike Walsh, uh, they remember him blowing up the levee. So right at that choke point, we, we don't say we blew up the levee, we say we operated the floodway, but we opened up this levee and let it relieve itself. Um, so we didn't try to fight and design a, a, a risk-based levee that could fight against everything. And, and to me, that's what resilience is all about. And, and we have to think about that in each of our systems because there's going to be a bigger Katrina. There's going to be a bigger Sandy. There's going to be a bigger Hurricane Maria. And they're going to be right around the corner. The other thing I'd say about that visit with Chen Li, he looked at me, he says, General Bostic, you know, the Chinese are pretty far behind the United States in, in water resource management infrastructure. So in the next seven years, we're gonna spend $670 billion and we're gonna build 170 projects across China. And he looked at me and he said, what is the US strategy for infrastructure? And I knew he knew the answer. I had none. Uh, we have no strategy. Um, we have projects out there, but, but a strategy going out seven or 10 years and that's why I'm really looking forward to an infrastructure bill that will, will look into the future and say, this is what the country is going to do in the areas that John and I have been talking about. Thank you, Tom. John, anything you would like? Yeah, to I, uh, I totally agree with Tom. That's uh, very good words. And, um, and I hope Congress will come up with uh, some focused um, opportunities and investment. Uh, uh, one area that Tom, I think, was alluding to was adaptable structures, things that bend but don't break and can recover. Uh, and this has to be built into the design criteria for, for anything. Uh, why are the question was why um, in recent years uh, are engineers a little more interested in this? And I think it's because we see opportunities for innovation and addressing climate change. And uh, these opportunities are gonna excite scientists and engineers in terms of, of, uh, of mitigating and uh, adapting to what's happening. 
I think one example would be when, when we, as we build new structures and new physical structures, we think about the digital part of it. For example, building in sensors that tell you something about uh, the uh, current state of the structure uh, or, uh, and give, might give you information or, or a warning if something's going to fail. Uh, and people are working on this problem uh, today, for instance, in bridges and worried about corrosion, putting in corrosion sensors, chloride detectors within the, the structures. Uh, one thing also is that when you look at um, what happened in Texas this year, the loss of power, that got the attention of a lot of people. Uh, and uh, as a, you know, whether it's climate change or not, climate change is statistical. You can't say one event caused it, but clearly events like this are gonna cause more of uh, such problems and it was a it was a, a loss not only of physical uh, infrastructure but also the the digital part of it as well so things have to come together and I got I think that gets the attention of engineers as well so I think the investment it, I remember this old commercial that used to be uh, about uh, changing the oil in your car it said pay me now or pay me later you know if it was like uh, you, you do preventive maintenance and and, and invest in in infrastructure, uh, you're going to save money in the long run, but that's a hard sell sometimes. But we got to make that sell. That uh, investment will save us money in the long run. John, sticking with you for just a minute, um, talking and talking about opportunities. The Academy has recently published a number of reports about the future of energy. What are the roles of different types of energy sources for providing resilient net zero energy to meet the nation's needs? And how do we create an integrated plan? with those? Well, it's, um, uh, we of course want to move towards uh, uh, minimizing or re eliminating in the very long term uh, greenhouse gases and even removing them from the atmosphere as well. Uh, the near, the zero, net zero carbon goals we have will require many creative engineering achievements. And I think uh, this is a great, this is a great inspiration, especially to young engineers, uh, students, as well as young professional engineers um, who want to make a contribution. So we're looking at things like carbon sequestration from combustion products, direct capture via photosynthesis and other means, wind and solar feeds. And I think we've got to revisit um, nuclear energy and fission, at least in the interim, to get to zero, uh, net, net zero carbon um, situations. I think we also have to talk much more about the grid. Uh, it's something that uh, <clears throat> the nation has to worry about. We have, to, we have national issues, regional issues, and microgrid issues. And if we're going to introduce uh, energy from renewables and other sources, we have to uh, develop technologies that allow that energy to be introduced into the grid in, in a metered and, uh, and in a safe way, robust way. And in the long term, there's interest in fusion energy. And I don't know how that's been, we've been talking about that for decades, but I do think someday, maybe, maybe not in my lifetime, but someday uh, fusion energy will be there. But it's gonna, it's no silver bullet. Uh, and we have to look at all these options as well. But I make that makes the problem interesting. And there's a lot of room here for creative people from various backgrounds to, uh, to contribute. I think this would be just a, a great, uh, a gr great activity for all of us. Thanks, John. So, Tom, um, how, how is the Army Corps working to better address infrastructure problems? And, and while you're answering that, would you speak a little bit to the differing roles for US federal policy versus state and versus um, local or tribal? Sure. Um, I, I think one of the key challenges that we face in, in trying to solve any problem out there is to, to really take the time to, to understand the problem in depth. And after Sandy, uh, the Congress awarded the Corps uh, $20 million as part of the 60 or so billion dollars that went 
post Sandy about 20 million in the core got about six, six billion of that, but 20 million was to look out 50 to 100 years, uh, consider climate change, and think about resilience for cities along the, we looked at about 31,000 miles of the east, or, east coast of the United States. And we created with the help of industry and academia and the public private sector working together, the North Atlantic Coast Comprehensive Study. I'd never seen anything like, quite like that, where we came together and really dug deep into how do we build resilient communities? And, and then the communities have taken off and they've done a wonderful job with, with this uh, throughout several major cities. Uh, Norfolk is, is a good example of, of that. And there's several others along the, the coastline that have used that report and, and focused on climate change 50 to 100 years from now and, and, and what needs to be done and, and a focus on resilience. So a lot of this work is at the state level. In fact, I've worked with the, the team in, in Norfolk to look at uh, resilient communities in, in that area. And it's really important, not only for the community, but from a national security perspective because of all the military uh, bases that are located in, in that area. So I think first, understand the problem, uh, study it, uh, map out a, a strategy for resolving it. And then it's gonna, take, it's gonna take funding and it's gonna take priorities like I spoke about before. And it's gonna take a focus on not just the, the, the hard infrastructure that um, some relate to the core, but, but also the, the ecosystem restoration, which is another main mission of the core to, to look at ecosystems and how do we consider the environment as we build infrastructure. I, I think about the Savannah River, Savannah Harbor uh, project. Um, and that was about a $700 million project, but over 400 million of that project was dedicated towards ecosystem restoration, which really shows a change in, in how the Congress, uh, the states and the local communities are looking at balancing the importance of maintaining our, our environment as we, we do things that are more on the, the, the traditional infrastructure uh, scope and size of projects. Thank you. So I, I'd like to take us in a, a slightly different direction talking about setting up for the future for the sort of last section of our conversation today. And, and we've heard about resilience, this principle of, of bending, not breaking, and ad adaptable uh, uh, structures. We talked about um, you know, preparing for the, the bigger Katrina, the bigger Sandy that's coming our way, and the need to have an infrastructure strategy. Tom was just talking about you know, the principle of taking the time to really understand the problem and map out solutions and then spend the money that it, that it takes. And we, we also talked about um, different technology approaches, including energy solutions for net zero as well. But let, let's take a look a, ahead at some of the people challenges perhaps and ways to prepare the next generation of engineers for such monumental tasks. And I, I'd like to start uh, by asking both of you, so you're both engineers and, and both uh, you know, have different specialty types. You know, what do you see the roles of different kinds of engineers in addressing um, mitigation and sustainability through infrastructure? Well, I could take a shot at that. Uh, when I went to school a long time ago, uh, societal needs were not part of any engineering curriculum. You had to take general education electives, but they were never connected to courses in engineering that you were and science, science and engineering it was all very technical. And we've moved, I think, over the past four decades or so to trying to introduce more of uh, societal responsibility into engineering curriculum. Uh, what, what the NAE uh, worked with universities, engineering colleges, to sponsor the uh, Grand Challenges Scholars Program, which is based on the 14 Grand Challenges that the NAE defined. And these were global grand challenges. They were not just US grand challenges. And that, programs like that have just interested students into looking, and faculty as well, into looking beyond uh, just the technical matter. What, what, what is the impact of this 
uh, on people and the earth and sustainability and so on. So I think making, in terms of education, students, faculty and students aware uh, of uh, what they, um, of the implications of their work and what they have to consider is just crucial if we're going to improve uh, improve our ability to engineer things properly as we've talked about today. Yeah, thank you, John. You've, you've written about the importance of addressing um, cultural, ethical, and social responsibility. And I'm so delighted to hear this, this discussed in the context of, of any future planning, of course. Um, I would like to see actually uh, uh, engineering faculty work with social science faculty on the curriculum. I mean, uh, I think that in, integrate it rather than taking a course in social sciences and a course in, in engineering, have some courses that are truly interdisciplinary that combine those things in any project you're doing. Thank you. I wonder, just a quick follow up on that. So we've mentioned earlier in the conversation that um, you know, uh, if, if we're not mindful of equitability, um, different you know certain people are are differentially affected mm -hmm. by infrastructure. And could, could we make that um, real by by giving just some a, a few examples of the ways that happens? You know, like I think of a highway going through a, a poor neighborhood, for instance. That's my example. Dan Ryan Expressway in Chicago is a great example of how it basically destroyed neighborhoods and segregated the city. I'm sure Tom has a lot of other examples as well. Yeah, I, I, I agree with this point. And I was fortunate to work on <laughs> um, a congressional report that um, was sponsored uh, by, it was sponsored for FEMA and it was looking at urban flooding. And it took us about two years. We went to some major cities around the country and we had a great team that put this report together. but. One of the telling uh, facts that came out of that was that, you know, the people of color and elderly, uh, the poor, disadvantaged, they were affected a lot more by where they lived and the urban flooding that was occurring across America. And this was a real problem for a lot of people for a long time. Uh, it wasn't the Hurricane Sandy or the Katrina or the Maria, but but these were real problem affecting everyday people. And it was affecting people of color in greater, greater numbers and, and, and people that were disadvantaged economically. Um, so, so I do think we have to do a, take a special uh, look at this and we have to focus on it. And the, the other thing we noticed in these sessions that we had that we'd go around the country is that a lot of folks from those areas would not participate in the discussions. Uh, so, so we had to really work hard to encourage them to have a voice in these sessions. And one of the things I commend John uh, for starting the Racial Justice and Equity Committee uh, in the National Academy of Engineering. And one of the areas that he has led the team to focus on is STEM education for people of color. Uh, this is a long-term effort. And in my mind, we have to start in elementary school and, and, and we have to develop folks that are from the ninth ward or from um, the south side of Chicago and other areas that are affected by uh, some of these challenges to, to grow up and be part of the, um, the discussion and part of the solution and, and to be in the forum where these, these, um, these decisions are being made. And, I, and, and it'll take us a while, but in the interim, we, we need committees that are focused in this area. And one that I'm happy to work on is the Gulf Research Program. And, you know, we have leaders like Senator Mary Landrieu, who's very, very interested. Um, she's on the committee and, and is very interested in how do we, how do we help those that are disadvantaged in certain locations, but we're looking at other places, but this is a very, very important point. I'm glad, Mariette, that you, you brought it up. Mm -hmm. John, did you have anything else? You look like you're about to add something, or if not all. Well, I think Tom brought up two things. This committee, Racial Justice and Equity, came about after the uh, incidents last summer. And Tom is on that committee, uh, along with 13 other individuals. And we're trying to do things 
in terms of uh, equity and justice uh, that are you know that, that are unique to engineering how we can make some kind of special contribution so that that committee is probably the most active committee we have in the in the NAE I also I'm glad Tom brought up the golf research program it's a wonderful activity in the national academies it was, it's uh, uh, funded by a settlement uh, with BP and uh, it's got great leadership and uh, they are looking at restoring, not only restoring, but sustaining the golf and the word it's people oriented as well as uh, environmentally oriented. So Tom's right, this is a really important part and uh, looking at things like offshore safety, uh, environmental contamination, so on and so on of the golf. So uh, it's really good to see any and the National Academies in general, very proactive in action and, and trying to do something uh, about non-equity and uh, injustice. You know, the, the, the other point I would just, that, that John made, I'd just like to also foot stomp is, you know, it, it's not only engineers. Uh, these are very, very challenging uh, issues that we're wrestling with and you want the engineers there, but I, I, I think about the sociologists, the, the psychologists, um, some of these leaders in other disciplines. Um, it's a dis interdisciplinary team that has to address these sorts of issues. There, there are people who are good at communications and, and being able to reach out and, and marketing and advertising and educators. Um, so I, 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 I just, although we talk about STEM and we talk about engineering and this is the National Academy of Engineering, this is a, a challenge that is an interdisciplinary type effort where we need a lot of uh, hands on deck. Tom, I would add public health as well. Exactly. Uh, as you said. So I love this discussion of interdisciplinarity and especially of, of equity, because surely if we're more equitable in our thinking, more of us will, you know, be happy over time and healthy and, and prosperous as, as the country indeed promises in its uh, constitution. But um, let, let's talk about a segment of these interdisciplinary groups. So we've had the broad picture, now let's zero in a little bit on engineers. So they you know, set, set code and, and necessarily often have to be a bit risk averse because roads, bridges, houses, dams, all of that has to be very reliable. So how do you help with that sort of shift of thinking where we promote the new application of technology and materials when, when engineers have a public duty to make sure that those projects are, are safe and sound. So how, how do you balance those? Well, I mean, personal sa safety is, of course, the top priority uh, on anything. And uh, I, I, Tom, Tom's a civil engineer, so he can comment on it, but they, a lot of safety factors are put in for a very good reason. And when I drive over the Chesapeake Bay Bridge, I'm glad they're there. Uh, so I get to the other side. But the, uh, 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 is, I wouldn't say risk averse. I say you just the number one priority is safety, and uh, you have to make sure. And you know, science and engineering are fairly precise, but not totally precise. And there, there are some things that can happen. So you have to put in uh, safety factors, uh, margins of error, and so on. In there, Tom can probably make a better statement about it than I can. Yeah, I'm thinking, Tom, balancing safety and, you know, so these traditional yeah. factors that we have to have, as John rightly mm -hmm. says, but against the, you know, the need for innovation, trying new materials, mm -hmm. let's say, um, new, new ways of erecting things. Yeah, I think, um, you, you know, both of these can occur together. Uh, we, we, we do have to plan for some, um, some give, some bending but not breaking, and, and that can be designed within uh, an engineering project. And there are, are standards that are set, um, and I, I think as long as you meet those standards but design resilience within, um, within the project, uh, that can be done. And as an example, the, um, there's a, a NIST study that was done um, in in 2021 and one that was done in 2019 that looked at earthquakes and and but but the 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 ability to design for earthquakes and and to be resilient it really applies to 
all types of natural hazards, whether you're talking earthquakes or hurricanes and, and, and those sorts of things. And, and I, I think as Congress builds um, the infrastructure bill, one point I would make is to, to look at the NIST study. This is the National Institute of Standards and Technology that NIST and FEMA worked on and ensure that those standards um, were incorporated in the infrastructure bill. And, and, and it's that, that sort of standard which will, will provide us the resilience that we need, but, but also be risk-based. You know, I spent, uh, like I said, I spent a lot of time in, in, um, in elementary schools trying to teach engineering, uh, but I teach it at a, a, a level that the youngsters can understand. And one of the things we talk about is an I-beam. And, um, and, and the kids say, you know, why, why do you design an I-beam like that? Why don't you just have, have a rectangle? You know, wouldn't that be stronger? And I said, sure, it'd be stronger. And I said, okay. Um, and I look at the person that asked the question. I said, you have to pay for it. And we're going to build that rectangle in gold. <laughs> <laughs> He says, oh, I, I don't want to build a rectangle anymore. Okay, well, you, you're going to build an I-beam, but, but as an engineer, you need to make sure that I-beam will bend but not break. And the way you do that is you follow the code. And the code has been developed over many years and tested. And, and we can meet these kind of standards. And I, and I think this new NIST um, uh, report is going to be very helpful uh, to not only engineers, but to the Congress and our infrastructure planning. Yeah. Marietta, I wonder if I can make one more comment about infrastructure that we haven't really touched on, and that is um, uh, if you look at the vaccine development for COVID-19, that was possible because of infrastructure, that platforms were developed over two decades uh, with a new technique, this mRNA technique and the adenovirus technique is in there over time. So I would consider health platforms as well as part of our infrastructure that when we have to address something, we need to be able to respond. And uh, so it's not just about roads, bridges, whatever, or just about uh, co coaxial cable or <clears throat> whatever. Uh, it's, it also includes things that, that keep us healthy and that's part of the infrastructure. Thank you, those are excellent points. I wonder, so we, we only have about maybe three minutes left and um, we've talked about a lot, uh, quite a range of things over our conversation today. I wonder if, um, you know, as a final question, you both might think about, you know, what is one thing you would really like today's audience to take away from the conversation we've just been having. Um, John, do you want to start off maybe? Well, the one thing I would emphasize is that as engineers, we must have constant focus on serving all segments of society and be aware of unintended consequences and, and uh, disparate negative results on certain parts of society. We have, a, we have a responsibility to do that. That's what I would, and infrastructure is a good example. Thank you. Tom, what are you what are you thinking about? Yeah, I, I agree with um, John, and I would I would add that we we need to take action now. This is not something that can wait um, another year. We, we have an opportunity, uh, um, and, and we really need to move out now. I think as we move out, we have to include many voices in the discussion. Uh, John has just mentioned, and, and we've mentioned earlier about. Um, the poor, the disadvantaged, and the elderly, and, and making sure we're doing the right thing by including many voices in the discussion. I've always been big on a systems approach and designing for resilience, and I, I think uh, our engineers and our communities are moving toward that. And, and we have to think for the long haul. Um, we're not going to fix this overnight, and a big part of what we fix far into the future will depend on the young men and women or boys and girls that are in school today that uh, are going to grow up and and hopefully live in a better climate in a better um, uh, resilient type uh, infrastructure and communities 
and some of that will depend on uh, some of them deciding to go into STEM careers. But, but it's an interdisciplinary approach uh, to solving these challenges, but encouraging some to go into STEM is, is something that I think we're committed to. Thank you, Tom, and thank you, John. Uh, and I hope everybody is uh, joining me now and mentally applauding you. So we, we've heard about uh, societal needs in this last section of our conversation, in particular about how we must take a more equitable approach uh, across our thinking and a more interdisciplinary one as well, with the idea of um, racial justice and equity behind everything that's done and how we balance safety versus new innovations. And, and John just, and, and Tom just left us with the thoughts around a constant focus on serving all segments of society and being aware of unintended consequences. And in other words, learning from the past. And um, you know, Tom just left us with the idea of really, it'd be really important to take action now and, uh, you know, and, and strongly so to make sure that we're doing so and in being inclusive with all voices so that we make better decisions and we'll end up with um, you know, a better, more resilient response to climate with our infrastructure. So I now thank you all so much and turn it over to Alex for the close. Thank you. Thank you, thank thank you, you again for you. joining the National National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine for our fifth climate conversation. I want to thank Tom and John for sharing their perspectives and to give a special thanks to Mariette for her skillful moderation, including her excellent recap just now. The conversation was recorded and should be available for viewing on this same webpage starting tomorrow. Again, there's a link above to register for our July 15th climate conversation, which you can also access by going to climate-security.eventbrite.com. Uh, at the event, we'll talk about the connections between climate change and security. Again, that's climate-security.eventbrite.com. We'll also share this information through our Climate at the National Academies newsletter, which you can also sign up for above. As a final reminder to share your feedback on today's event or your ideas for future events, please see the survey linked above. Thanks to all of you for joining us again, and thanks to Mariette, Tom, and John for sharing their time and expertise with us and their leadership in this area. Um, lastly, thank, thank you. you to the Climate Communications team at the National Academies and to everyone behind the scenes who supported today's event. We're excited to continue the conversation through future events like this. Stay cool, everyone, and have a great day.